This is my third and final Chinese art lecture. The Yuan, or Mongol dynasty, lasted less than 100 years. Kublai Khan's successor simply proved less able to sustain the rule of a foreign dynasty. The successor Ming dynasty is another golden age of Chinese culture. It was this dynasty that moved the capital to Beijing and constructed the Forbidden City as the center of imperial rule. But first, to round out our dynasties, I should note that a final dynasty and another non-Han Chinese dynasty took power in 1644 and ruled until the fall of the empire in the early 20th century. Beijing's Forbidden City remained the center of imperial power throughout this dynasty, but most of its essential structure was established during the Ming Dynasty, so that's where we'll linger. The Ming Dynasty initially established its capital in southern China, in Nanjing, but the third Ming Emperor moved the capital back to Beijing. You need a break from the disembodied voice, right? So let's watch a short clip from a good National Geographic video about the Forbidden City. Here's a map of the old city of Beijing. Note that there are three walls, the wall around the outer city, the wall around the imperial city, and the wall around the sacred heart of the city, the so-called forbidden city, which is our required work. We'll return to the video in a minute, but first I want to make some points about the sacred and political geometry of the forbidden city. This plan is one of the five required images from the college board. And here's a more helpful labeled version of the plan and the three specific buildings on the required works list with their placement. The final required image is an aerial view. I'll put that up in a minute. Here we see more clearly how the layout of the Forbidden City was prescribed by a complex Chinese cosmology. The city followed an axial plan. Remember that square or rectangular shapes represented the earth and the emperor ruled over the kingdoms of the earth. It was the emperor's sacred duty to maintain cosmic order from his throne center in the Hall of Supreme Harmony, whose placement at the center of the Forbidden City symbolized the emperor's placement at the center of the world. Note that the most important buildings lie along the central north-south axis. The Forbidden City is also laid out in threes, which is a sacred number in China. In Neo-Confucian philosophy, the number three represents the unity of yin and yang. So the private residents are placed in groups of six, that is three times two. The roofs have three tiers. There are three central ceremonial buildings beyond the meridian or front gate. Here's the last image, the aerial view. Let's return to the video. I want you to think about, and more important, take notes about, how the organization and decoration of the space reinforced the emperor's dual religious and political roles. You should also pay, pay attention to the AP Daily video screenshots that I've included in your workbook. The long essay it walks through appeared on the 2021 exam. Let me make a couple more points about the way the Forbidden City was laid out and constructed. Here you see the plan of a traditional multi-generational family compound in Beijing. Note that it too is organized on a north-south axis. The head of the family lives in the principal house on the north, and the other families are assigned houses strictly according to rank. So the Confucian hierarchy determines the layout of both Chinese domestic and imperial spaces. Also note that while the Forbidden City buildings are huge, the vast scale is part of the power and authority message it's sending. They are built of wood according to the same construction plan that's used for smaller buildings. Traditional Chinese construction is post and beam or post and lintel, like that of Greek temples. And like Romanesque cathedrals and Gothic cathedrals, Chinese post and beam buildings can be expanded by adding new bays formed by beams and purlins the limitation being that a bay can be no longer than the trunk of an available tree. The curved eaves, on the other hand, are a purely Chinese feature. Let's return to the video one last time and learn about the private living quarters of the emperor. You won't forget about dragon symbolism or lucky colors, right? The required image on the upper left doesn't show up in the video or in the Khan Academy essay, so let me just say a few words about it. This palace was built by an emperor as his retirement home, but he died before he could retire to it and decreed that no one else should ever live there. He began to build it in 1772, which makes it a Qing, not a Ming work. I'm guessing the College Board included the interior shop because it is considered one of the most beautiful classical Chinese interiors to have been preserved. Those emperors knew how to live well. 
Okay, I really am running out of time, so I hope you read the homework because you need to know the narrative behind this work. Let me pose this basic question. How does this work fit into the traditions of Chinese art that we've just examined? In other words, how does it represent continuity? Well, first look at the landscape in the background, the towering mountains, the clouds, the mist, the highly detailed foreground. Think maybe this painter knew his Fan Quan? We also see a heavy reliance on iconography. Okay, we have an umbrella instead of a dragon. But actually, umbrellas also symbolize leadership. In Chinese culture, they symbolize the emperor. In Buddhism, they symbolize the Buddha. We also see a lot of red, green, and yellow, or at least gold. Again, symbolic colors for the Chinese. In fact, I'd argue this painting is, in many ways, all about the mandate of heaven bestowed upon a new emperor, Chairman Mao. As it happens, this was an emperor in trouble. Mao's reforms had unleashed famine and popular backlash, and the Cultural Revolution he instituted to restore ideological purity tore the country apart and indeed was repudiated by Mao's successors. If you'd like to learn more about Chairman Mao, the Cultural Revolution, the Great Leap Forward, I've put an excellent video up on Canvas entitled Great Leap Forward. The recommended times are noted here and on Canvas. This is really worth watching and it will give you a head start on next year's AP World History Summer Assignment. So how then does this work represent a change, a departure from Chinese tradition? Well, the original was painted in oil, not ink. Oil paint was very much a European material. The figure in the landscape, far from receding into insignificance, dominates the page. Fan Quan would be shocked. And finally, the painting and subsequent poster, the most reproduced poster in world history, are examples of a very European art form, socialist realism. Here on the right is another example from the Cultural Revolution, a hyper-muscled worker reading Mao's little red book. There's one last work that will appear on tomorrow's quizzes and the test. It's another global contemporary work. We'll return to this work in the spring, of course, but it relates so closely to the poster of Chairman Mao that I want to introduce it in this unit. The Cultural Revolution of 1966 to 1976 was Mao's attempt to maintain revolutionary fervor after his Great Leap Forward had pretty much turned out to be a Great Leap into a very deep pit. When Mao died, the leadership largely abandoned his economic and political radicalism. Their message to the Chinese people basically was, go ahead, enjoy your newfound wealth, and keep your mouth shut. Chinese students in particular did not want to shut up. They started asking for more political freedom. To their credit, they wanted more from life than blue jeans and rock music. So this work, what is called an installation, was shown in China in 1988, just before the massacre. The authorities soon cracked down on what to their minds was a subversive work, and the artist fled to the United States, where he worked for 18 years. He returned to China in 2007. Like many of the works we've seen, A Book from the Sky is a tribute to an older cultural tradition. Zhu Bing painstakingly carved all of those wooden blocks and printed up reams and reams of pages in his Book from the Sky. This kind of woodblock printing was an ancient Chinese technology, although we've seen that it was later used by the Japanese to produce prints for the mass market. Excuse me, we will see. What made this a subversive work instead of a tribute to the ancient Chinese arts of printing and calligraphy is that these meticulously carved and printed characters, some 4,000 of them, are complete nonsense words. The communist officials thought they had to be some kind of dangerous secret code, but in fact, they're just meaningless characters. Chinese audiences can't read them any better than we can, although at first they expect to, which makes their experience of this work rather different from that of non-Chinese Westerners. So what's the artist's point? The original title was Mirror to Analyze the World, the Century's Final Volume, which suggests that it was a commentary on our age. But the artist later changed the name Dianshu, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. In Chinese, this means divine writing, and originally referred to certain kinds of religious texts. But the term has evolved, and now it's used to mean gibberish. Anyway, on to Korea and Japan.